Uh, this webinar is focused on upcoming musicians, um, professionals in industry, and those who are looking for that um, formula of developing strategies for moving their careers forward in terms of, you know, how you go about planning certain things. Um, spe specific aspects include, today we are going to focus on um, four main aspects. So the first segment is called Catching the Streams. And then we move to mind your business. So we look at some of the business initiatives and, um, you know, some of the business uh, registrations and so on that artists and um, labels, all stakeholders in the music business should actually be um, implementing and have implemented. And then we're going to talk a bit about, you know, your digital health um, and for you know, looking at ways to assess our digital health in the digital music industry and how to position ourselves to the digital music industry. And finally, building your artist shield really deals with systems of protection and being able to move your career forward um, in the best possible way and while protecting yourself. So catching the streams, all right, um, over the years, I've found one of the areas that uh, a lot of um, DIY artists, um, and not only artists, but musicians and producers, songwriters, all the stakeholders in the music industry, I found that they uh, lack an understanding of the different sources of revenue and the different revenue streams that exist in the music industry. And here we have some of the broad ones, right? We have the three main sectors, these sources of revenue come from the three main sectors. So one of the main sectors we have would be the music publishing sector. And the music publishing, as some would know, the music publishing deals with the ownership of songs, all right, and finding ways of monetizing songs. So these could be um, finding sync placements in movies, um, film, television, gaming. Um, over the past few years, we had Netflix making a, a big impact internationally in terms of sync revenues and uh, musicians being able to publish um, works in you know, popular television series and, and that type of thing. The second area that we have uh, is the, the recorded music stream or the recording stream. And traditionally, we would have known this as the you know, we'd have known of CDs and be um, CD sales or whatever the carriers were. We had um, cassettes, we had LPs, we had CDs. And over the years, we have evolved and um, digital music streaming is now the dominant um, recorded music format in the world. Um, digital music has surpassed um, physical copies, selling physical copies of, of, of songs and so on for a few years now, probably since 2018 or 2019, they're about. All right. So we have, um, you know, digital music. And this is one of the areas that um, is still under development in, in the Caribbean and still needs, artists need to, artists need to take um, significant and a consistent action where um, this aspect is, is concerned. Uh, we have some people, of course, um, distributing their music to these digital platforms, you know, the Spotify and the, the, the Apple Music and Pandora and um, Amazon and all of those. But as we would see in a little bit, um, distributing the music is one thing. We still have to have promotion in order for people to know that the music exists out there. And in addition to promotion, we have to be able to collect all of the revenue that is due to us. Um, I see as well a lot of um, artists, songwriters in, in the Caribbean are leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, because while they are getting some money from their sales, right? If I can use the word sales of you know their streams, they are still not collecting all of the revenue, right? So we have different types of revenue for interactive streams, which would be like Spotify and Pandora and so on. And then we have non-interactive, which would be like internet radio, 
and a different agency collects for non-interactive. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about those and and as we go further as well. And then the third major stream would be the live performance stream, and this is a stream that we know quite well in the Caribbean uh, because of our strong affinity and strong links to festivals such as Carnival and you know Crop Over and Junk you know, and all all of those festivals that we have um, in this part of the world. All right, so those are these are three major revenue streams in the music industry. Um, but uh, related to those, we have a fourth one, which would be the brand-related revenue. So this comes from things like merchandising. So we have merchandising, we have endorsements. And one thing that we uh, must be, one thing we must acknowledge is that in order to really profit from this stream of revenue, we have to have popularity. We have to have a certain type of brand recognition, a certain type of name recognition that uh, persons would gravitate towards, that brands would gravitate towards, that um, brands would you know, want to sponsor, brands would want to engage in partnerships, branded partnerships, uh, where they receive promotion for certain things and they would provide income um, in terms of, you know, um, financial support and that type of thing. So that has to be developed. Um, you know, it takes a certain type of um, brand recognition and name recognition to really profit and to benefit from that. In addition to the brand revenue, we also have the knowledge stream. So we have some uh, musicians, artists, producers that are involved in teaching. All right. So let's in. Um, you know, passing on the tradition. So you may have some type of music academy. You may have some sort of, um, you know, program, artist development program that uh, you are working with upcoming artists. You are working in the studio to develop talent. You know, you're working with upcoming songwriters, um, that type of thing. Um, so we have the teaching stream, which became very popular recently. is also very popular in the. Um, it was also very popular during the, the the pandemic, where we had stay at home restrictions and so on, and you had many musicians turning towards um, the teaching stream and being able to, um, you know, impart their knowledge to artists and upcoming uh, musicians that are interested in learning more, developing their craft. And then the second aspect of the knowledge stream is the producing, you know, music production. Uh, the reason an artist chooses a, a certain uh, producer is because they are going for a certain type of feel. They want to create a certain type of mood, a certain type of effect. And that's, the producer is only able to create that because of their unique artistry. All right, so you would, it's unlikely to have uh, multiple producers with the same uh, style, all right? So persons would go to a certain producer for a certain style um, or a certain feel, um, certain quality of music. And that's also important as well. And then the sixth stream that we have, which again, may be related to the brand stream where you... Um, you have to have a certain name and recognition in order to really pursue this. Well, at least one aspect of it, which is the corporate funding aspect of it. So it's, it's sort of related to the brand um, revenue stream. All right. Um, but there's this aspect of it known as crowdfunding that I'm sure many people may know about. Or if you don't know about it, you just um, look at the, the prime examples like kickstarter.com where uh, bands, you would see them posting certain um, assets in relation to their practice. So maybe they want to release a new album and they would go on to Kickstarter. They would create a video to um, pitch, a pitch video to pitch to their fans. Okay, well, um, this is what we want to do. We want to create a 12-track album. And when we create the album, uh, we are going to invite you to the album launch. We're going to give you um you know some backstage passes we're going to give you a few of the um you know we're going to give you access to to the album in some way you get to come and meet and greet the band 
uh, whatever it might be, they offer certain incentives in exchange for investment from artists. Okay, so that's the fan and the crowdfunding aspect of it. Um, here in the Caribbean, and one case, of course, in Trinidad and Tobago during the pandemic, we had certain um, entities doing live streams and they would fund the live streams through, um, you know, crowdfunding type initiatives. So they would put it out to the public. There's a, a certain platform that they would have used and put it out to the public and people would, um, you know, donate, um, give money and so on um, online they had you can do the text messaging sms text messaging they, they could have you could have also done um the your credit card payments and so on on the respective platforms and those and the the funds from that would have been would have gone towards paying the artists and covering the production course of those live streams all right, so those are just some, you know, those are the, the six main ones. And I've seen over the years that some of our artists, some of our songwriters are leaving money on the table where that is concerned, um, where, you know, they they focus on one thing. So if it's, it's, if it's performance, live performance, they do live performance, which is fine. All right, but if you really want to look at the holistic, um, holistic, development and 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 um acquiring different streams of revenue especially if you are doing this at uh at uh you know professional level semi-professional level you would want to um get your stuff at you know as at, at, at a certain standard right so these are just um some examples and some things to follow um to think about i should say all right so the second aspect of it you know minding your business and I found as well that many um, of our professionals in the industry, uh, they would operate informally, right? So we are seeing now where um, you have some, some formal arrangements taking place, but still we have, um, you know, it, it's, it's informal to a certain extent. And uh, when we talk about in you know formality, we are talking about the form of business uh, organization that groups, artists, bands choose to adopt. All right, so it's not because you know, the, the the artists, right? The band, the the it's an uh, it's actually a business. All right, it's a business entity and it should be thought of as a business entity. And it's important to um, have certain types of organization, organizational structure. All right. So of course we have the common ones, which would be sole trader, whichever one in our jurisdiction, you'll hear that too. Um, in the US or some other territories, you may hear sole proprietorship. All right. And then we have a limited liability companies. So sole, pro so, so proprietorship would be an individual operating a business as a, a one man show, basically. But of course, it can be registered and should be registered with the relevant um, business registry in whichever territory you are operating from. And then we have, of course, limited liability organizations and these limited liability um, organizations, uh, what you call an LLC, uh, would you register, of course, with the relevant business registry again, and then you would, um, you it offers certain protections. So certain protections, like um, as it says, limited liability in the case of um, action, some sort of legal action against you, against the, um, you know, the business. It doesn't affect you personally, but the the business is separate and a separate entity, all right. Um, and that also always works well for companies in the in the music industry. Um, we have partnerships. Some bands operate as partnerships, and then we have cooperatives, which um a certain type of business organization. We had one um you know past student who is interested in um starting a credit union for musicians. And credit unions operate as cooperators, right? So we have that, um, you know, we have those four main types. And um, it's always recommended that um, 
artists, musicians are able to adopt um, some type of formal business structure. It's quite important. Uh, and most importantly, in addition to, um, you know, just registering, there are certain uh, things that need to be done to keep those business registrations um, up to date, right? Keep them, um, you know, updated or compliant, as we say, with the state. And in the form, for example, limited liability companies, you have to file annual returns. And that's one thing I've seen a lot of musicians as well. Yes, they, they take the first step in registering their business, but then many people, and not just musicians alone, this, is, this goes for small business entrepreneurs, uh, micro entrepreneurs, um, from a holistic standpoint, they sometimes forget um, about annual returns. Right, and it's not because they want to, um, you know, they don't want to. It's because of knowledge in many cases, and these things sometimes result in penalties, penalties with the state, um, penalties, um, you know, and it affects your all wrong operations where that is concerned. Uh, another aspect of it, in terms of you know, minding your business, uh, would be collective management organizations and. Collective management organizations, as we know, work to collect revenue on behalf of artists. Okay. So we have a number of them in Trinidad and Tobago. We have um, the COT, which is the Copyright Music as Organization of Trinidad and Tobago. In the different islands, so in Barbados, we have COSCAP. Um, in the Eastern Caribbean, we have ECHO, which is the Eastern Caribbean Collective Organizations, I believe. And in uh, Jamaica, we have JCAP. Right. So we have these uh, collective management organizations and they, of course, the name collective management organizations, they collect. All right. And, and the collective management, um, they represent a number of rights. So you have the um, the copyright and which you call um, copying of actual recordings and so on. Um, copying of the song, I should say. Um, that is called, of course, the mechanical rights, all right? And then some of them, well, most of them, all of them do performance rights, which would be the use of music um, in public spaces, all right? That's the one that we, we really know them for. Um, but one area that these organizations have to really think about is digital licensing and digital collections, all right, because when we talk about the an, uh, developing an artist strategy, we have to know and we have to be clear as to how could collective management organizations in the Caribbean, what revenue are they collecting from digital platforms for you? And this is something that this is a question that needs to be answered. It's ne it needs to be clear as to what uh revenues they are collecting on your behalf or what revenues they are capable of collecting. So when your music plays on iTunes or Spotify and you're a member of one of these regional organizations, are they collecting on your behalf, right? We know that revenue is generated for sure. Are they collecting on your behalf, right? They have some of them have reciprocal arrangements, reciprocal agreements. And these are things we need to know. All right, we also have artist registries. So um, in Trinidad and Tobago, for instance, we have the artist registry of Trinidad and Tobago. The artist registry uh, is housed at the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts. And it's good to be certified for whichever area of the music industry we are operating in. All right, so for instance, as an arts education organization, we, Diane Jen, is registered with the Artist Registry in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the Artist Registry has a number of fields of endeavors. So if you're an artist manager, if you are a music producer, if you're involved in live streaming, you're a sound engineer, um, the Artist Registry assists, well, well the, you can register with them and that you know, bring some measure of legitimacy as well, because what they do, they request samples of your work and then they would, um, you know, have those samples assessed and then grant you um, 
you know, registration under a certain field of endeavors. In addition to that, they would also have, um, you know, um, newsletters, um, professional development for musicians and so on. And these things are very important in terms of uh, helping you grow, um, helping you network as well, and also developing that relationship, that partnership between you and the line ministry uh, at a governmental level um, in the in your country, right? I know that different islands are also working on um, developing artist registries. I'm not clear as yet on what the um, the the actual um, you know statuses in terms of how far they have reached and and that type of thing, right? So those are those are important and these are important things to remember. All right. So we move right along into the, you know, the boosting of your digital health. All right. And I have this photo here. Um, and you may ask what's the relevance of that photo. So for some people, if you follow our social media, you follow our um, you know, blog posts and so on. We have a number of blog posts on our website. Um, very educational, very um, detailed blog post. And I encourage you to go onto our website, diangen.com, and check them out. They range from copyright infringement, um, articles on copyright infringement and how to protect yourself. One of the most popular ones is one on digital um, distribution, how you actually di uh, pursue digital distribution in our part of the world, um, you know, how to actually collect revenue um, some of the places to look how to develop a strategy for collecting your revenue and working with your collective management organization. So those are things that you you can go onto our website and check it out, um, dyingen.com, and just look for blog, and you would see all the the um, articles from over the years. Right. So this last year I participated in the International Music Business Conference. Um, it's called the International Music Business Research Days, where I prepared a paper on the impact of COVID-19 on the live music sector. And I, I received an award for um, the best paper at the International Music Business Research Days. Um, one of the prizes that I won for that was this book on rethinking the music business. Right. So we had we have the authors there, Guy Morrow, Peter smock and then daniel norgard and you know in, in one of the articles there and i dealt with it in the blog post and and you will see it if you um go and look at that um in one of the articles or one of the the chapters the authors dealt with being ready you know being ready and certain indicators that you are in a state of readiness for success in the digital music industry, all right? And they had seven basic indicators, seven basic indicators. So the first one, of course, was recorded music product and having a quality recorded music product. Of course, that's if you're involved in recorded music, all right? Um, you may be involved in a different aspect of the industry. You may be a, pro a producer, um, right? But for... The artists, the DIY artists, the artists that's working towards growth and development, you know, you have songs out and that type of thing. Um, these are one of the things we are looking at in terms of readiness, right? So having a, an actual recorded music product and, um, you know, so quality songs, quality recordings, the, the music is your product and your product that you take into the market must be something of, of quality. All right, you must have something of quality, otherwise fans will not um, want to hear that. All right, um, so it, it, it must provide value to the fans. Um, you know, your songwriting must be at a certain high level. You must have production, high quality, mixing and mastering to a certain high level as well. And the second aspect of it is music brand and image. How how are um how are things with your music brand and your your image branding is important um for effective music marketing right brand identity created through visual images right so 
It includes the art of style, how you look, or how, 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 how you look. Do you have the look? All right. The artwork, the type of artwork and the type of merchandise that you have um, on offer. Right. Um, the written narrative is their story. Did you work with a, a, a publicist? Or if you didn't work with a publicist, um, you know, is 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 your narrative, is your story captivating? And these are things that are important. What's your social identity? Um, seeking out the services, and, and these can be achieved by seeking out the services of professionals, of course. But I know for the upcoming artists that, you know, these things may be costly, right? But you have to develop a strategy in terms of being able to roll these things out and afford to, um, you know, have certain images of a certain quality, have your music brand, your music image up to a certain standard. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the fourth thing that we have, or the third thing I should say, is the industry proof. And the industry proof is really embedded in the views of industry stakeholders. How do people perceive your brand? You know, what do the important influencers are you in connection with any of them? Are you networking with any of them? Right? Radio programmers, uh, music reviews, podcasters. What are they saying about your, your stuff? Online tastemakers. All right. And we are looking at this. Yes, you might say, okay, well, you know, I, I don't have, you know, the, the, the type of recognition out there or whatever the case might be. But you, we are, you remember, this is a roadmap that we are developing. So these are ideas that you shouldn't be thinking about if you are um, looking for that long-term, you know, longevity in the industry and so on. I industry proof is what legitimizes you, right? What are people saying? What are the, 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 the who's who in the industry saying about what you have to offer and what you, what you do? And, um, you know, developing a strategy to... Um, network with these individuals uh, is very important as well. Uh, fourthly, we have the live music product. Um, artists must be able to support their songs with quality live music performance. Right? Quality live music performance regime. Right? There are many people that I remember a few years ago um, seeing some artists with wonderful songs, brilliant songs for carnival and so on. But when, they, when, they, when you have to actually go out there and perform those songs, when it's time to really go out there and perform, uh, that's where there's a gap between the recording and the performance. And having that stage presence, you know, having that, um, you know, being able to go out there and to do it and to do it professionally at a high level um, requires practice. Right, you must be able to deliver quality vocal performance, instrumental performances, you know, especially as new digital opportunities emerge, right, for live music. We had the entire live streaming craze that was taking um, place at one point in time. And, you know, persons lamented that, you know, in fact, the study that I did, monetization of those live streams were um, some of the biggest problems, you know, among the biggest issues. We're getting persons to pay, and and the 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 it it was really a twofold problem because um in addition to the pandemic we had a type of um, recessionary type of activity where persons just don't have the money to pay for stuff at at at, at a certain point in time, but then we have a uh, um aspect where people just don't want to pay, right? Some people pay for Netflix, fine. Right, but when it comes to supporting a live stream, supporting your favorite artists, and so that's where um that's where there's a, a gap, and that's where there needs to be um some type of consistent action. Um, we have the the fifth aspect of it, you know, having a digital presence and digital distribution, and as I said um before. We have that this this aspect is really um becoming very popular here in um Trinidad. It has become very popular. In fact, 
in that um you know most people now are you know you use distrokid or one of those platforms to upload your music right get your music up onto these platforms um but as i said in the opening remarks that having the music up on the platform is one thing but being able to um actually collect revenue being able to market because you have the music on the platform. There are hundreds of thousands of other artists on the platform. But how are you going to get uh, eyeballs to follow you? Right? Some people are uh, the, the same thing they did in the in the offline world with collective management. What they do is they, you know, the music is out there. And then when they see their statements to the digital um, platforms, they want to know, but how come, you know, how come is this? But you are not promoting. Right, so if you're not promoting, you can't be discovered, right? And there are a number of ways to promote, and that would be in a future live stream in terms of, um, you know, playlisting and trying to get on these different playlists on these platforms and so on. So, in addition to that, we also have having a, an artist website or any type of business website in the music industry. I remember some years ago we we had a blog post as well. Um, uh, on uh, you know one of some some of the the mistakes that artists in the Caribbean are making, and one of them is not having a website. And when that blog post was circulating, I remember one guy in particular. He made a comment. Uh, well, I agree with most of it except um, having a website because you know um, when people want to get to your music, they want to see your socials. They want to go to SoundCloud, right? Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that an artist's website is very important in, in the artist development, the artist strategy, especially in the digital era. Um, when you have your music up on these platforms, you are really at their mercy, right? So if they decide to change, you know, to change direction, to change how they're approaching their, you know, their personal business strategies, they can just take down your music. They can take down your page, right? So it's important to have your own platform where you could really control the narrative, control what it is you, you put out there, all right? And more importantly, you can even have websites with e-commerce capabilities, all right? Um, one of the main things and one of the main areas I recommend that um, all artists and artist teams think about is having an email management system. All right, a CRM system, if you wish, um, but email marketing system. And you know that one of the main ones on the, the market, we have MailChimp. We have another one called ConvertKit that's very, um, you know, has a, a lot of features and so. But it's very important to collect email addresses for your market, right? Whether it, uh, you be an artist, whether you be, uh, an, you know, a an, uh, producer, it's very important to have to be able to send out emails. Yes, you can do social media ads and so on, but then social media ads tend to be very expensive. And in addition to that, you also have the same issue of you know, the platform. You, you are the mercy of the platform. They could decide how many eyeballs you see or how many eyeballs you don't see. So it's very important to have an email marketing system also built into your website. And they, you might be saying, okay, so where are we going to get money to do all these things? Right? You would realize if you just do some research that there are a number of platforms that you can use, you know, a drag and drop builder. So for instance, we have like Weebly, we have Wix, where you can basically design a website for yourself, for your artist, if you're an artist manager, for your business, right? If you're a songwriter, or producer, or whatever the case might be. So just by understanding some of these things, um, you can, you know, have a professional disposition, a professional organization in terms of how you set up your business and how you move your business forward and so on. Um, digital presence, again, you know, it's important to have your optimized social media. So yes, we still want social media. Social media serves a specific purpose and we still want to get, we still want to have social media that's optimized. We still want to have our music on all the platforms, right? We want to have our music on all the platforms. So we want to have our music on 
um, Spotify. And, and usually when you use these some of these platforms, you get the music um, on you know hundreds of hundreds of different platforms. When you use some of these aggregators like TuneCore or CD Baby, um, these are uh, you know you 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 get your um, music on uh, around the world and a global distribution as some people like to see, right? Um, and you know it allows for music discovery and 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 all of the um those things that are important that, that you need to have um in addition to digital presence we also have social proof and social proof you know is really measured in numbers you know the interactions and streaming popularity um so people would usually compare in terms of you know um you know how many likes you have how many likes on your platform right but I mean, that's some people describe it as a vanity metric where I'm um, just knowing how many likes. Yeah, you might have a page with 32,000 people on it, 50,000 um, fans, right? But when you put out a post, you, you don't get any engagement, right? Could you convert those, those fans into actually paying fans if you were to um, have some type of intimate live stream um, concert? Or you have some type of, you know, intimate concert at some small venue. Could you really monetize those um, 50,000 or 32,000? Would they really come out, right? Again, it, it depends on the entire network of things that we are talking about um, here, working together, all right? So social proof, you know, is important. Um, but um, it, 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 it has a special place then. Right. Um, so and looking for new artists and partners, you know, brands always looking at um, you know, the how artists set themselves apart. And it comes back again, you know, in in when I went to school in New York, I had uh I, I did an internship at this company called Livestream. And what Livestream did is that they they held concerts at different venues around um, you know. Uh, Manhattan, Miami, wherever, and they install cameras They at those venues. And when artists go to perform, they would stream the concerts on livestream.com, which was one of the um, big platforms at that point in time. And part of it, they did they also, before each show, they would do promotion for the artists or the band that's performing. And one of the factors that they use to decide if to promote this band was whether the band had a website, you know, how they're looking on social media and weren't only looking at likes, but looking at, you know, the frequency of posts, the quality of posts that these artists and bands are putting out. Um, and these were some of the, the, the metrics that were being looked at to decide if to give promotion to this band. And the reason really was that if you don't believe in yourself, why should the company be investing in you? Why should the company be spending, um, you know, pr promoting you? They could promote another band, all right? Um, so that's very important. And that's where having the website comes into play and having social proof, um, you know, is, is, is very important as well. Um, so these serve as, you know, an indicator of popularity, legitimacy and overall influence in the market, right? Where people are looking at what other people are saying, you know, about you, right? Uh, monitoring your digital performance with tools such as Vibrate. I don't know if you all know about Vibrate. You can check it out. V-I-B-E-R-A-T-E, right? Vibrate. You can check out the trial I went on and I looked at who were the biggest artists in terms of social media here in the Caribbean. And um, well, the data is kind of skewed because they're showing us people like Rihanna. And I, I discovered someone by the name of Hadaway for the first time, right? Who has some sort of Trini links, right? But it's, it's a German Trini type of connection, right? And we had the Billy Oceans and, and these, right? So they, they are tracking, um, you know, the how the artist looks in terms of social metrics. We also have chart metric, 
which you can also check out as well. Chart metric, um, you know, these provide deep insights into your social positioning. So you can see exactly if you go on to these platforms, they, they offer free trials. So you can go on and mess around with the tools a little bit and see what's happening. You can actually see, um, you know, how many um, followers an artist have on, on Spotify, right? How many YouTube followers you can also look at, you know, how the artist is performing in terms of um, YouTube, you know, how many streams, how many views, how many visits, that type of thing. And data that can really be used to um, improve your practice, improve your design, improve your, you know, inform your touring strategy as well. If you're able to, to see and know, you know, so where my um, biggest fan base is, you know, and, and really understand exactly what is required to um, reposition your um, reposition your music business, right? And then the seventh one, well, we spoke about this before, um, the seventh, you know, factor or indicator of readiness, um, according to those authors. And I really like their framework and that's why I'm sharing it with you. So you might say to yourself, well, um, you know, I don't have all those things, right? Mm -hmm. But you get a, a step-by-step -step, um, breakdown as to what you should be putting in place. And you may not, or you may also not have the finances. You may not have the funding to do it, but you should take incremental steps, right? So there are platforms like Canva.com that people can use to do graphics, right? You might reach out to somebody who may help you, right? And these times people not really helping anybody per se. Some people would, would help, right? But people kind of shine away from the pro bono stuff. Right, it's really up to them whether they want to help you or not, right? But you could you can try that. But there's also a very strong DIY. You know, these tools allow DIY, right? And if you as the artist can't do it for yourself, right? We don't expect the artist to be able to do it for themselves, right? You can have somebody, some relative or some member of your team that may be really interested and be able to help you um to execute it. Right, so the business structure we spoke about them before, um, earlier on in the presentation, and um, you know, so you have the, you have the four, you have the four main types there, but of course you can have others, um, but those are some of the main types, and I really implore musicians to get into it. You know, we always have these conversations during the COVID period when there were these um, the grants being um, issued and so on for um, artists, for musicians, um, there was this, um, you know, there was a segment of persons who were basically making statements that, well, you know, um, you know, do these people pay taxes? Do we know um, if they're paying taxes? You know, I mean, it's aid. So on the aid, you, you can't ask about taxes at that point in time, right? Um, are these people registered, right? These are some of the, the, the things that you, you're hearing, right? If you looked closely during the carnival period, you would have seen that Inland Revenue, the Inland Revenue Service in Trinidad, they put out a reminder to promoters and so on that you have to pay taxes, right? You have withholding taxes for those who are, bringing artists from abroad and so on. And we are going to deal with those things in a future webinar. Um, we, are, we are going to get to that point. Um, the webinar series is really going to focus on um, a lot of um, contemporary issues in the music industry. We also have one plan on estate planning. We saw, we saw um, during the, the carnival period again with the Soka Artist Blacks and some sort of discord there with family and um you know royalties and and that type of thing and this is why these 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 having this business structure is extremely important very very important as you plan and as you plan to move your career and your practice forward all right so finally we have a you know we're coming up to the 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 end of it where we'll take a few questions and so the artist shield really deals with you know systems to protect yourself right, and to protect your business and your practice. At a very basic level, we have split sheets for songwriters. Um, one thing that we see as well is 
We also see hesitation with respect to um, for those who have to sign contracts. I mean, if somebody is investing in you, right, genuinely investing, right? I mean, there are many stories of people who have been disingenuous in the industry and people who have, you know, really um, left a sour taste in people's mouth. But if somebody is really investing in you, you want to sign a contract in terms of, you know, what, you know, what your expectations are and what their expectations are and to have those things um, written down, right? Um, the split sheets, you want to know very early on in the studio what the, um, you know, what the arrangement is in terms of um, royalties, what type of royalties, right? Are we sharing royalties? Is it the mechanical royalties? Are we sharing the master royalties, right? Um, how, are, how is this going about, right? Um, and these things are very important and very important to have. We can't say this enough, right? We also have things like the rider and the technical rider for those who are sound engineers and even those who are touring and those who are performing musicians. And you may request certain equipment to be used that for a specific performance, right? The rider is usually a part of the contract that you have with a promoter, right? Um, the, the, or a promoter with a song company in the case of a technical rider, right? So it's important to have these things. I know very well that we don't operate so in the local industry, right? In many instances, in many instances, all right? And um, we want to get these, these things up to, up to a standard because the persons who are thinking about exporting their talent, exporting their music. You want to get into the practice of, um, you know, doing what is right from a very early stage. And um, it also adds to your entire, um, you know, professionalism, your, your entire image and brand as well. Um, and it pays off over time. Consistency pays off over time. All right, and I'll share some more about that probably in another another session that we have another time. Um, ensuring compliance, right? So ensuring compliance with, um, you know, as as we said when we did the the first um, you know, in the first segment, uh, minding your business. Remember annual returns. So some people forget about it. It's a genuine thing in some cases. Right, we have taxes, quarterly taxes. We have different types of taxes. You may have corporation tax if you make a profit, but then if you you probably didn't make a profit, but you made um you have tax on what I call compulsory taxes on revenue, which would be like the green fund levy and the business levy, and whichever jurisdiction that you're in, right? Whether you're in the U.S., whether you're in the Bahamas, you're in Jamaica, you're in Barbados, and Lucia. Right, whichever jurisdiction you are in, you have certain procedures to follow and certain policies, certain laws, legislation with respect to taxes. So it's very important to understand what those are and to try your very best to align your operations with them. Right. So the ideal thing, the third part would be to implement an accounting solution. So there are solutions like QuickBooks, which Currently, they're offering a, 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 some sort of discount. You can check them out, right? But if your operation's not at that level, you can just use basic Microsoft Excel or, or Google, Google Sheets, all right? Templates to really organize your accounting and to have some sort of structure in there um, for your accounting, right? So the music industry, um, you know, it's, uh, as we see internationally, um, digital music has taken over the world. And basically, in no other, there's no easy way to say, it, but in the Caribbean, we have basically allowed um, digital music to falter. Right? Um, there are a number of people that still don't believe in putting their music on streaming platforms. Um, yes, we know about the revenue, um, you know, the revenue streams would seem to be very low, but there are a number of different things in there. Um, there is also people are not collecting all their revenue, okay? So the sound exchange, people are not registered with sound exchange. Recently, as last year or year before, the US, there's the Mechanical Licensing Collective, MLC, that regional artists can register with. 
and the MLC collects revenue for mechanical uses of music. And I, I, don't even, I don't even need to do a study. I can tell you that there are a lot of regional and local artists that are not registered with the MLC. They are not registered with Sound Exchange. All right? So there's a lot to, to be done, right? And it, it comes back to knowing what rights are at play, right? So you have to understand, okay, the mechanical license, the performance license, you know, synchronization and so on. And then being able to leverage those to the best of your ability to grow your practice, right? To grow your, um, to, to, to grow your business, to grow your artistry, all right? And for those who might be thinking about, you know, further training and so on, we have, of course, the Introduction to Music Business course at Diagen, which is very popular. It's an online course. And we have a discount being offered on that right now, um, which is basically 100 TT, 15 US off, basically. So you just go on to the website. You can choose the Introduction to Music Business. And if you're interested in checking it out, there is that, that code there, the coupon code A to E, Artist to Entrepreneur, from Artist to Entrepreneur. You just put in that in the coupon code box and you will see the, um, the discount ap appearing in your cart. All right, so thanks so much for um, joining us on the live stream. I would open it up for a bit of questions and interaction of persons would like to interact a little bit more. You're free to just, um, you know, put up your hand or write your question in the chat and we will take those now. Remember, it's a series, a monthly series. So the next one that we are going to have hopefully would be the end of July. That would be on the taxation and the music business. And then at the end of August, we are going to have estate planning for musicians, which really deals with, um, you, know, you know, organizing your business in such a way that you can... Um, you know, you don't have to leave your children and your children, children to fight, right? But, um, you know, you you are able to leave um, things in a certain way for them that there is no fighting, right? Things can be passed down from person to person easily. All right. So questions, any any questions before we go? All right, so I'm seeing a question from Denisha in the um, you know, the the in the chat. She's asking, what are the first steps you need to take when it comes to managing an artist? Right. And um, you know, it, it really has to do with an assessment. I if you have taken the decision to manage an artist, I I would believe that of course you believe in what the artist has to offer. And you believe, of course, in the potential of the artist. Remember that the relationship between the manager and the artist is what we call a fiduciary relationship, right? So it's a relationship of trust. So there must be that trust between the artist and the manager. Um, and so, so that, of course, is the first thing, that there must be a genuine um, appreciation for the art of the artist and a genuine appreciation of wanting to see what the artist could really bring and, and bringing all the best, of course, in the artist. Then I would probably look at developing some sort of plan in terms of, you know, um, looking at the seven, the seven um, indicators that we spoke about, right? Does the artist have music out there? Is the music of a, a certain quality, right? Um, what is, um, is, is it of, you know, um, high production values, Right? Do they have the brand? Do they have the image? And if they don't, you have to start working on those things for them. In addition to that, you would also want to, um, I mean, while you're doing that, you have to ensure that they are bringing in revenue. Right, And of course, they can only bring in revenue if there is value, if the songs are valuable, if the live performance is valuable. All right, So there must be some sort of assessment. There must be an assessment there. And then from there, you would develop a strategy for the artist, help them to, um, you know, work on different aspects of, of, of their career. But of course, set um, small, set measurable goals as, um, as you go on, all right? Measurable goals as you go on, all right? Um, I hope that, that answers the question. We have Sheldon Mendoza. He's asking, um, does it... Uh, 
with the uh, he's asking about if there are any confusion results from the you know the MLC, the AFM, the ASCA, BMI cut sound exchange, and do they go after separate royalties? And yes, they do go after separate royalties. All right, so we have the MLC, which is the mechanical licensing corp, um, me mechanical licensing collective, right? And that's um basically because of the the act that was passed in Washington just about two years ago. All right, um. And that is um, mechanical licenses for digital uses of music, all right? Digital uses of music, mechanical licensing. We have the AFM, which is the American Federation of Musicians. That's the second aspect you're asking about. And that's basically a, a, a musician's union, all right? So American Federation of Musicians, they would set certain standards for musicians in terms of, you know, um, you know, how long, especially in, in orchestral music, how long they're supposed to pay, uh, play for, um, you know, the type of payment they're supposed to get. Um, if, it, if it's scale or scale and a half, depending on how long you want them to play for, that type of thing. So that's basically a union, right? So they don't collect revenue per se. We have ASCAP and BMI, which are the international, well, in the U.S., these are performing rights organizations only. PROs, they manage the performing rights, right? So they collect revenue, licensing revenue for use of performing rights. So performing rights would be when music is used in these public spaces, music used on television um, and, and, and so on, right? Live music, right? So they would license certain venues and so on. All right, so they are performing rights organizations only. And then we have Cartier in Trinidad, which is a collective management organization. So in addition to performing rights, they also manage mechanical rights as well. And as of recently, well, a few years ago, I, I saw them promoting that they also do neighboring rights, right? which is rights related to the producer and the artist and so on. Right, so different organizations do different things, and then the last one you have sound exchange, which is the um, they um, collect revenue for non interactive uses of music. So, non interactive uses of music would be music on internet radio, where the user cannot request a song, so the user cannot go and say, All right, well, I want to hear uh, Marshall Montano, right. You put it in, you may play, they may play a martial or they may play something similar to that, right? But it's non-interactive, right? Um, Internet radio, Pandora, right? They give recommend, you know, you put in one artist and then they play a string of artists along, along that, right? So those are non-interactive. So sound exchange collect revenues for non-interactive, okay? And then if you distribute your music through CD Baby or... um these um tune core they they would collect revenue for the master right the master recording and some of them do collect revenues for um uh, mechanicals as well um some of them are offering a, a sort of package service where they collect a, a number of um you know a, a number of royalties and some of them try to get your music involved in sync synchronization uses and that type of thing but um, that's a generally they all um. So as I I was saying in the beginning, it's very important to um have a conversation with your local CMOs, right? Your regional CMOs to find out to what extent they are collecting revenues from these um you know these international platforms. We know that they have reciprocal rights, right? We know that they for sure have arrangements with ASCAP and BMI and so on. But we want to know to what extent they are collecting digital revenues. And that's something that really needs to be clear. All right. Um, I hope that that answered that question there. Do we have any other questions? Anybody would like to ask anything or have anything else they would like to, to, to discuss before we close? All right. Okay, so we seem to be um, fine with that. All right, so of course I 
I will take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us this evening for um, this first webinar. Um, there would be, as I said, a number of other webinars. Um, they are being planned at this point in time, all with um, you know, the goal of improving our Caribbean music industry. We also have a number of courses. We have a professional program that is coming up. If you all looked at the, well, if you, you, you may have seen or heard that we recently were um, you know, awarded one of the UNESCO grants to develop the online school of music. And the online school of music is um, school of music industry studies, I should say, right? And um, part of that would be offering scholarships to persons to pursue um, of course, there would be a, a proper registration process because we want to get serious people to come on board, all right? But um, very low cost training, international certification on music business at the level three level, as well as music production, um, mixing and mastering at the level three. And that's coming up um, very soon. So stay tuned to all our platforms, our social platforms, our email list, and you will be hearing a lot more about that. That's a project that's going to run over the next year. Um, so you will hear a lot more about that. All right, so thanks so much for coming on board, folks, and for joining us. Um, the recording will be available. Um, it's right now we are streaming on Facebook, um, but we are going to edit the, um, you know, the titles and so on, and we are going to make it available on um, you know, our website and um, send the link to all those who would have registered. All right. So thanks so much for joining us and all the best as we move forward.